Welcome to your course, Aging and Exercise, Reduce Cognitive Decline with Physical Activity. Thank you for joining us for today's course. My name is Jackie Crawford and I will be your host. Joining me today is our presenter, Diane McCaughey. Diane, come on out. Hey, Jackie. Hi, how are you? Nice to see you Good again. Good to see you too. So you are joining us from Florida. I am. And you have been a family member of ACE for a long time? 20 years. Yeah, so mm -hmm. master trainer with ACE for about 20 years. And tell us a little bit about what you're doing now. So I run a geriatric business in South Florida where we have a lot of older people. And I specialize in fall prevention, post rehab, and now becoming a big issue, cognitive decline. Yeah, right. So you also did a study in your, for your PhD, right? So yeah, tell yeah. us a little so bit more about PhD's that. So my PhD is in gerontology, the study of aging, which I thought was appropriate for Florida. Mm -hmm. And my dissertation work wasn't really in the physical aspect. It was more in the emotional cognitive aspect, was understanding the evolution of reflective wisdom and mm -hmm. how it relates to surviving life crises. So looking mm -hmm. at the brain, looking at coping mechanisms, and the behavior change workshop is one of my very, very favorite, which is gonna be very important in this workshop as well. Right, so you're taking the cognitive aspects of active aging and kind of putting them with the behavioral aspects, mm -hmm. melding them together, and we're gonna learn a little bit about that today. Right, because they're so related. And this is an exciting new topic and we're in the right place at the right time. Great, exactly, let's get started. Oh, thanks for having me. So welcome everyone, I'm very excited about this workshop today. So we're going to go over some learning objectives. First, we want you to be able to identify positive and negative factors that affect cognitive reserve. Cognitive reserve is the brain's ability to resist damage. If we can do that, we're not going to have as much cognitive decline. We have cognitive ability. That is using brain-based skills to be able to finish tasks. Very simple task or very complex task. And then uh, cognitive function. So the cognitive function is our ability to do activities that center around learning and problem solving. So a lot of executive function. And that's how we stay independent and navigate in a very complex world. I want you to learn innovative research because there's a lot of research out there with guidelines as we have for fitness, we want guidelines for cognition to improve that function with exercise. And lastly, at the end, you will see and hopefully learn how to create and apply some simple and fun activities using both cognition load and physical variables in a layered response, which will be very specific to the client and how they're learning. I would certainly like to start out by giving some acknowledgments to two people who have been very instrumental in doing research in the area of cognition and exercise and bringing them to the fitness world. First, Dr. Cody Seip of the Functional Aging Institute, FAI being an educational partner with ACE, and Dr. Seip is one of our bigger researchers who has collaborated with Ryan Glatt. So Ryan is a psychometrist, which is an individual that not only gives cognitive testing, but also knows how to read it. And he works at the Pacific Brain Health Center in California. And Ryan is in the production of putting together our first cognitive uh, certification for fitness trainers. So pay attention and keep looking for the brain health trainer coming soon. So thank you to both of these individuals. So I think it's important that we understand what cognitive decline is. There's a lot of terms out there in our industry. Let's go deeper and really understand them so that we know how to use them. So the first question I want to ask you is what is your greatest concern for yourself as well as your, cli your clients, hello, across the health of your lifespan? In the past, it was certainly cardiovascular disease and cancer. But today, because we have no cure and really don't have a lot of modifiable treatments, the number one answer is cognitive decline. Let's look at some statistics here. 2015, not too long ago, 47 million people worldwide had dementia. Dementia is a term that we use for symptoms of cognitive decline. There are over 100 types of dementia. So projected here in 2050, 
this number is to triple. And in 2030, which is only 10 years away, it is going to double. One year ago, it cost our country $277 billion. So this does make this important. Let's look at the screen and look at what we call normal aging or cognitive aging versus diseased aging. So if you look at the bottom line, you see that those arrows just gradually go up. So not only cognition, but that could even be with our physical level. So we have what's called the first preclinical stage. Client says, wow, I really feel like I'm losing some cognition. I walk into the room, I say to myself, why am I here? I can't remember somebody's name. It does come back. Uh, little things. So the client's aware of it. There are no tests that are being done. The doctor's not aware of it. So we call them the worried well. It's probably normal cognition decline with aging. And then we get into the next stage, which is called mild cognitive impairment. Now, the client's aware of it. The family's aware of it, and there has been some testing and that we definitely see some significant impairments. However, the activities of daily life are preserved, so this client is still independent. Maybe they have sticky notes all over, possibly the spouse is helping them remember things. Notice how that line becomes blue, then dark blue, and then red. So boom, it's more of a drastic decline there. And then we have dementia, which I said there are over a hundred types. Mild, moderate, moderately severe, and very severe. And that is where the cognition impairment is so severe that it does interfere with everyday life. So probably not able to be independent and the cognitive function very decreased. So we need to be aware of how to see our clients and help figure out where they are. You're not going to be diagnosing but you probably want to be referring. And sadly, you may be the only one doing that. So let's look at the difference of that mild cognitive change with aging and actually the disease of Alzheimer's, which is a part of dementia. So in the disease, we have chronic degeneration of the neurons. Regular aging, we just you know, the neurons pretty much stay the same. Maybe they're not functioning and firing quite so well. Right now, we have about 10% of older Americans that have this disease, although we feel like that was a, a number that was decided several years ago, and we do know that that number is increasing. And when we have regular cognitive decline, it really occurs in everyone, and it's gradual. It's not so extensive. And then with the disease... The decline is very often and could be very severe and gradual. The other ones are variable depending on the client and gradual. So something for you to understand the difference. Let's look at some terms that we use in our industry as well. And we sort of throw these terms around loosely. So I think it's important that we understand what we're talking about. So if we talk about or hear about the term neurogenesis, neurogenesis means the process of actually creating new neurons. And what is the surprise of many people is even as an adult, you can have neurogenesis. The problem is we can create new neurons, but do they survive and are they integrated in the system to create a longer lasting plasticity? And we're going to talk about how to do that. Synaptogenesis is the creation of the connections between those nerves in the brain so that the information is moving to other areas and that it's moving fairly quickly. So we're going to talk about processing speed as we go, which again, this slows down as we get older. We need to practice it to bring it up. So, so the brain is very similar to our muscles, use it or lose it, and very specificity in our training. And lastly, big buzzword in our industry is neuroplasticity. So that is the brain's ability to change its structure, its function, and its organization. And this is due to several things. One, response to novel experiences, new things, learning new things, doing new things, and then how it's associated with the stimuli. So exercise is a big part of that as well. And we want that neuroplasticity or that longer implementation of those neurons. So we ask ourselves, what can we do as fitness professionals? And that's important. 
Well, the Alzheimer's Association has come up with a conclusion. They believe that regular physical activity and the management of cardiovascular disease can reduce the risk of cognitive decline and may also reduce the risk of dementia. So when we think about it, we certainly want to be moving, but we do want to manage those uh, risk factors, diabetes, obesity, hypertension, and hopefully through exercise and stress reduction and good hormones, we may be able to stop smoking much easier. So that's nice for a fitness professional. We want to work on the physical body, but that can also impact the cognition. We're not only going to look at positive neuroplasticity, we're also going to show you negative neuroplasticity. So what I want you to think about is this plasticity or our cognitive impairment is very fluid. Think about it more like being blood pressure. Many things interact on it, and it is constantly changing. It's not as static as our height that doesn't change day to day. So the first thing we're going to look at is cognitive remediation. So cognitive remediation is doing things that are not with medicine or medication. So that could be all the things listed below. Good exercise, good sleeping, good nutrition, stress reduction. So that's where behavior change comes in. And if you have not taken the behavior change and practice workshop through ACE, I think it's a big integral part on working with cognition with a client because some of those issues could be childhood issues, stress-related, or just bad habits that could be changed. Active lifestyle. We need that not only for our physical body, but if you stimulate yourself in the active lifestyle, you're also stimulating your brain. Neuroleptic agents, that is medication, especially for people that maybe are a bit delusional, have a lot of anxiety, paranoia, hallucinations, and sometimes dementia or other cognitive issues can bring that on, which is going to create probably lack of sleep, too much stress. So sometimes medication is needed to do that, and actually the client will do much better. Good nutrition. So we know that for a physical body, but our brain also needs good nutrition, good sleep. And we all know that when we haven't slept well, we, our brain doesn't fire as much. We're just not as spot on. Good health. And we're going to show you a diagram later where all the, the functional health, physical health, they impact each other. So again, all of these issues are like blood pressure flowing back and forth and affecting each other and certainly physical exercise, which we're going to look at specifically what exercise does what. So when we look at good neuroplasticity, we had mentioned these in our objectives at the beginning. Cognitive reserve, stopping the brain from having a lot of damage, its ability to do that. Cognitive ability, brain skills that help us complete tasks. Simple task complex task, and then the cognitive function that is our ability to do skills more with learning and problem solving that's more executive functioning that helps us to navigate a very complex life and hold our independence. Important. Now, on the negative plasticity, it's almost the opposite of what we just talked about. If we don't do stimulating activities physically or mentally, then the brain is not going to be used. Use it or lose it. We want that firepower coming in there. Negative moods, depression, anxiety. And in our behavior change workshop, we talked about how important having positive psychology, being positive about what we do, focusing on what we want, not where we are. And a lot of that sometimes is biochemistry, but it also could be how we think and process. We have 60,000 thoughts every day. Tomorrow we will have the same, and 80% of those thoughts will be the same as yesterday. So we want to think positive. If you don't have good nutrition, you're not going to be feeding the brain. If you don't sleep well, everything just isn't functioning up to speed. Poor health, everything integrating and affecting each other. And if you're not moving, your brain is not being stimulated, nor are you getting blood flow to the brain like you need to. So all important to know the positive and the negatives and how behavior change is going to be a big part of this, helping your clients with their cognition. So we ask ourselves, 
what effect does exercise really have on cognition? So let's look specifically at all the parameters of functional fitness and how they affect each other. So look at your screen. This is a pretty busy uh, diagram here. And there's actually another one that has little legs coming off, so it's even more intense looking at each specific part. But we're going to look at cognition at the top, which is important. And a lot of times when we think of cognition, we think of memory. But memory is only a part of cognition. So we look at confidence and motivation. So if we've had bad experiences, if we're depressed, we're not going to have a lot of confidence and motivation. Therefore, we're not going to do a lot of the other parameters that you see in this diagram, which will affect our cognition, as you saw in the earlier slides, on positive and negative neuroplasticity. Pain can be a big one, too, which could be somewhat neurologically or somewhat emotionally. And again, the behavior change. Problem solving, executive function. Remember, learning and problem solving, very important in our cognitive function and our ability to stay independent. And then if we're not mobile, if we don't have good balance, we're not going to be moving as much. So again, more negative neuroplasticity. So all of these things interact. Pay attention to this. Make sure that you have it ready and available when you're doing program design because this becomes a part of it as well as the cognition. Let's look at aerobic exercise. So one thing that I think is important for you to understand is aerobic exercise is the most type of exercise that has been studied with cognition. And one of the reasons is how they did it. So if they studied rats or mice, they would put them in cage and have wheels. So they were either voluntary running on the wheel or involuntary running on the wheel. So most of the time they were doing more of a moderate aerobic pace, which has been touted as being the best pace to do for cognitive um, improvement or stopping cognitive decline. Again, a lot of the information that we have, some is controversial, some is, you know, we need more investigation in these areas, but it's a great place to start. So we do know that aerobic exercise increases BDNF, which is brain-derived neurotrophic factor. This is in the hippocampus, in the temporal lobe of the brain. That is known to be the center of learning and emotion. So that is why that we can see uh, memory improving and that we can see anxiety and depression going down. So BDNF is a protein that also helps neuron survival. So we talked about making new neurons, but it's important that they grow and that they mature and that they are integrated in the system for neuroplasticity. So all very important parts of aerobic exercise. Now let's look at blood supply, which aerobic exercise has a big part of. So we do know that the brain does not receive as much blood as the other organs of the body, which for me, when I learned that, that was sort of a surprise because it's a very important organ. So we do know that the blood it does get is extremely important because it brings oxygen and glucose and other nutrients. So we know that this does decline as we age because we're not as active. We don't create as much vessels in that system to create this blood flow. So another reason that it's important that we do aerobic exercise to stimulate the brain and get that blood going up there. And lack of blood flow has been shown to increase cognitive decline. So we say, what's good for the heart is good for the brain. And that is a great selling tool for you as a fitness professional to get people to start doing their cardiorespiratory activity. We're following the guidelines of regular cardiorespiratory activity for the brain as well, 150 minutes per week of moderate activity. So something for you to think about, which may be difficult for your clients to get at first, but it's a goal for all of us. Let's look at resistance training, even though most of the studies have been with the aerobic exercise. So resistance training stimulates insulin-like growth factor 1, or IGF-1. And IGF-1 has been found to decrease with age, and there is a link between the decrease and cognitive decline. We do know that IGF-1 does several things. It increases protein synthesis, it helps with insulin sensitivity, and it also helps promote fat utilization. 
So those things go back to the cardiovascular risk factors. It helps with diabetes. It helps with uh, metabolic syndrome. It helps with um, obesity. So again, related to the body, related to the brain. The other thing that I found quite interesting is they believe that resistance training could be a form of cognitive training itself. Why? Because it's more effortful. Sometimes when we think about aerobic exercise, maybe we're just out there mindlessly walking around. If you're doing more effortful aerobic activity, just bringing that heart rate up, better. When you strength train, you think about your posture, you might recruit muscles, you're thinking about alignment, all of these things. And sometimes our exercises are more complex, which I like that. And even more importantly, they are finding that there are improvements of executive function and processing speed, which are very, very important in cognition and our ability to navigate in a very complex world. So let's look at that uh, processing speed and executive function. So executive function is found in the frontal lobe of the brain or in the prefrontal cortex. Notice on this slide, it talks about emotion and feeling, which is very different than the cerebellum, which is more automatic and more instinctual. However, we do know that as we get older, even our automatic reflexes don't work as much, so we have to think a little bit more about our balance, et cetera. So here, they talk about the prefrontal cortex guides our behaviors, our thoughts, and our feelings. That goes back to our behavior change. We know that our beliefs and our feelings create our emotions. Our emotions create our actions, and our actions create our outcomes. This is also a part that is very responsible for foundational cognitive abilities, and we're going to look at those in just a minute. So those help us navigate through this complex world. Um, let's see. I also think it's important in the feelings and behavior. So if somebody is diagnosed with frontal lobe dementia, maybe their behavior starts changing. Maybe they don't have a filter anymore like that they used to. So something to be aware of. You may be the only one seeing this, and referrals are very important. So with executive function, we look at six different domains. We've talked a little bit about the first two, our emotional regulation and our inhibition, how we feel about ourselves, how we feel with society, how do we interact, some voluntary, some involuntary. So again, possible behavior change could help with this, or it may actually be some type of cognitive decline. In our function, in our cognitive function, we have to look at attention, paying attention. And we're going to divide that down in just a moment of types of attention. Our memory, which we know is important, short-term memory, long-term memory. Our planning and organizing, which helps us to navigate in life. So I have a client who has dementia. He lives in a condominium building. The sad part is there are three condominium buildings right beside each other. They look exactly alike. So he'll go out the front door, he'll start walking, and then he looks at these three buildings, and he can't plan, organize, or figure out, problem solve, which one of the three are his. So again, that changes his life forever. So we are going to look deeper at attention, and we're going to look at dual tasking, putting our attention on more than one thing at a time. We've selected three types of attention. The first one is selective. In other words, when I'm in a room in a gym, and I see that with my clients that have had strokes, some that have certain types of dementia, too much stimuli out there, music, banging weights, people talking, people moving, whoa, they cannot pay attention at all. So it is our ability to focus despite distractions, and they say that there's a very slight decrease. You may see more, and some people may have never had it their entire life. So something to try to figure out. Dividing attention. Now we're getting a little bit more into multitasking, doing two things at once. There's a moderate decrease here. So I have a client that fell. She was talking on the phone, going out, picking up a big box, and then trying to step over a lip that is at her front door, and she fell. So possibly if she put the phone down, she might be better off than doing three things at once. She's 92 now. She was 90 at the time and actually doing very well. 
but we know that that moderately decreases. Her physician told her, do not multitask anymore. So basically he's saying, don't go out in the world because our world is all about multitasking. Maybe instead, pay attention more, don't do too much at one time. So the next one, can we switch our attention between those multiple tasks? There is a significant decrease. So that's where we may need to pay a little more attention and be careful. Our ability to hold our attention for a period of time does not decrease at all. However, some people have never been able to do that at the beginning, so of course they're not going to be able to do it when they're older. So something important for you to pay attention to in program design. So the definition for dual tasking is concurrent performance of two tasks that can be performed independently, but that have very distinct and separate goals. So let's look at our ability to do this with age. Number one, increases the time it takes to react. So my client that fell, talking on the phone holding the box, probably when she was younger, a little bit, rerouted herself, on she goes. We just don't do that as quickly anymore. And our walking speed decreases, which also affects a lot of those other physical parameters that we saw in that FAI sheet. So again, they're relating to each other, which may cause more run-ins with objects and more fall risks. So something to pay attention to. And we want that dual tasking to be better. We don't want to be told, don't do this anymore. So something else that I think is extremely important for us to understand. So there was a consensus statement in 2014 that said, claims promoting brain games are frequently exaggerated and at times misleading. So it might be crossword puzzles or little games on your computer. So those are games where you're only using your brain and not your physical body and your brain at the same time. There is conflicting data on whether just using the brain games can enhance broad cog cognitive abilities and enable one to better navigate a complex realm of everyday life. Just like my client picking up the box and she does crossword puzzles every day. Maybe we want to combine the two. So if this is some conflicting data, but we already have proof that the physical exercises improve cognition, wouldn't it make more sense if we combined the two? So here we have it, physical and cognitive exercise together. So it has been proposed that doing the physical and the cognitive exercise simultaneously might interact to induce a larger functional benefit than doing the physical by itself and the cognitive by itself, even if we added that together, doing it separately. We want to do multi-component exercises. So exercises from different modalities at the same time, bringing that cognition into it. So you know the benefits of aerobic exercise. You now know the benefits of resistance exercise. We want to put cognitive stimuli in with that. Now the postural, the balance, the agility, the mind-body, and the coordination, more from the cerebellum, but they're more effortful, mind-body, which is a great way to bring attention into it and stimulate the brain. So the brain can be stimulated through thinking and effortful learning, especially while moving, as well as the physical exercise. So you have a, a double dose there. And there is that more potential for that synergistic effect. One plus one is three, so a bigger compound than doing each one of these independently. And the cool part about dual tasking or multitasking is if you're dual tasking, you're doing a physical and you're doing a cognitive, but you're also dual tasking, so you're doing a minimum of three things at once. So here, just wrapping it up a little bit more for you in the physical and the cognitive. So we're going to look at, at the right on the physical activity. So we assume that physical exercise does increase the potential for neurogenesis and synaptogenesis, creating more neurons, creating more connections between those neurons, while the cognitive exercise guides it down to be implemented into the system and induce more positive plastic change creating that 
neuroplasticity that we want. Let's look at some cognitive exercise guidelines. So we have guidelines for our physical fitness. We also need guidelines for our cognitive fitness. We have specificity guidelines for physical exercise because we say, especially as people get older, they're like snowflakes. And you know, I'm not making a pun here because we're talking about cognitive decline and they're flaky. What we're saying is that no two are alike. They're very different. And so when you create your program design, it has to be specific to the client that stands in front of you. We want to challenge the brain and the body simultaneously. So you have to look at all those factors that enter in and, and any, we say, detriment that they have at each. So for myself, I've had three knee surgeries and a hip replacement. I can't do a lot of the running and jumping to bring the cardio respiratory system up. I have to find other ways to do it. So we have to look at all those modalities when we're doing the program design. These exercises that we put together have to be challenging. They have to make the person think. They have to make them a little challenged. But we don't want it so challenging that it becomes frustrating. We don't want it so challenging that the process speed is so slow that there's no exercise effect meaning that we're not bringing that heart rate up. It's got to be interesting to the client and really fun in order to be effective. And we don't want to compromise technique, posture, and we don't want to have a lot of compensation patterns that enter into it, just like our regular exercise programs. We want them to incorporate this into our daily life. We want to give them homework. So if they're doing mindless walking and it's more at a lower intensity, maybe we could say you're walking around your neighborhood. Walk a little faster from one house and then take it back to the moderate. So we're bringing up the intensity and tell them, hey, why don't you try to count down backwards from 100 by 3? So we're getting some mental stimulus. And again, the only thing that limits you is your imagination. So come up with some really great ideas. We do know that the more time we spend on these cognitive exercises, the better the results. Here they're saying 40 minutes versus 20 minutes. And we want to do them multiple times throughout the week. So just having somebody march in place and say a couple of numbers once a week, that would be like doing a bicep curl once a week and expecting to have muscle growth. It doesn't happen. And we may not see results for three to six months, but we do know over time it will happen. So guidelines are important to follow and to know our parameters. We do want to load with these cognitive factors, but then you're going to change the acute variables that make the cognition harder. Going faster, which means they have to think faster, faster synaptic, or we call it processing speed. Longer periods, so that they're having to think harder. And if you see the smoke coming out of their ears, probably time to shut it down, right? The load. The load could come from the exercise itself. It could come from cognition or it could come from some kind of combination between the two. When the frustration comes in, when the biomechanics start coming down, we have to look at that. The environment, whether we're looking at having selective attention, being able to be in a crazy, busy environment and shut everything down, or if we're on an unstable surface, those things changing that environment makes the brain work a little different. Having the client change directions, which is a way to navigate more in a complex world, great way. And you can do that pointing, you can do it verbally, auditory, visually. We want to change those both. And what we're seeing is that once people's eyesight starts diminishing, once their hearing starts diminishing, there is more cognitive decline. So as you can see, I'm wearing my glasses today because after learning this research, you know, my vanity has to stop. I want to be able to see so I can get more stimuli, which is better for my brain. So your clients that don't want to wear their hearing aids, when you tell them they're going to have more cognitive decline, that can be a big incentive to put those hearing aids in. You're going to see me layer activities, making them harder. But I'm going to do that in a way that the processing speed doesn't shut down it's too much on the memory or there's frustration that begins to come. 
you really only need to be able to have perfection in about 80% of it. You don't have to have mastery on this. Postural control, as we said, good biomechanics, and somewhat of a completion of task. Again, at least about 80%. We're going to give some examples here. These examples on the left are talking about the difference versus general physical activity. And I mean maybe something that's a little bit more mindless. So these on the left are a little bit more effortful learning where the cognition comes into play more. So Taekwondo, it doesn't necessarily have to be Taekwondo, but they're saying more of a martial arts type thing. Why? There's a lot going on. Lower body, upper body, you've got your cardiovascular, you've got some uh, muscular skeletal things going on, you have a lot of switching and attention. If someone's sparring or fighting, then there's a lot of executive function going on, problem solving, a lot going on in that. On the slower end, you might have yoga or tai chi. You've got a little bit more of the automated stuff with balance, but again, getting harder for someone who's older, so they're going to have to pay a lot more attention. And I'm not saying that you couldn't have a yoga class that's more of a faster flow yoga. Might be a little bit more memory in here than processing speed, but there's lots of different domains that we want to work with cognition. We've talked about multiple component exercises. So you're, you're doing three things. You might do a cognitive thing, a physical thing, and then you're actually dual tasking, which really helps the brain work. And all of these things that we do, we want novelty. We want it to be new so that we have a learning process here. So they're having to think. And that's why maybe a new sport or a new game they always tout ping pong because it's quick processing speed. There's a lot of reaction, hand-eye, visual, those type of things. And pickleball is the number one growing sport for the baby boomer that has a lot of those great novelties, physical ex exercise and aerobic activity, and thinking. Dance, some memory that goes into dance and coordination and thinking, very good for the brain. And then as we've talked, any combination of cognitive and physical exercise, which I'm going to show you some examples in just a moment. So we're going to start now with looking at some of these cognitive exercise drills. I've only selected three drills because of time, but I wanted to show different aspects of what we're going to be working on in our program design. The first one is called exercise flow drill. This one you might even see something more of a dance or a martial arts thing. What I've chosen are three separate exercises that I want to be done in a flow pattern. So there's going to be some memory in here, processing speed, etc. The second one is called the color toss drill, which I'm going to be using two different color tennis balls, switching right and left and layering more movements in there. Again, some problem solving, some processing speed, some memory, definitely attention on all of these. And the last one is the clock drill. You may be doing this already right now. We're going to add more layers to that clock drill to make it more effective cognitively. So we're going to start with the exercise flow drill. I'm going to bring my client, Debbie, out for you to meet and for her to help us. Come on out, Deb. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to so see you. So I met Deb yesterday, and we were in the studio practicing a little bit. A little bit. She has never done any cognitive exercise drills at all. So processing speed was down a little bit, maybe a little more anxiety yesterday. Now, if I know Deb, she was home last night practicing, et cetera. <laughs> So I'm going to actually change a little bit of the layered effect today, Lovely. sorry, so that we have that reality going on. So we're going to take a moment here, and we're going to set up our three stations. Come on, Deb, let's get the station going. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. And we'll bring those back just to here so we're all in line. So I've selected these three exercises because in the fitness domain, they're actually working on different parts. 
and then we're bringing the cognition layering in. So the first one is more for balance, weight shifting, and memory here. We're gonna do one rep of each to start out. The second one, more of a bend and lift, more musculoskeletal, maybe some mobility of the joints, wider stance, toes slightly out if needed, bending down. Now, if the client can't touch the floor, that's fine. Little bit more, more mobility, maybe cardiorespiratory, four bounces backward and four bounces forward. Now, I'm not going to do a lot of correcting on skill or biomechanics. Uh, we looked at it yesterday. She's certainly not going to hurt herself today. We did work on dribbling yesterday because she was kind of doing this flat hand slap. So we definitely want you to work on that as well. Okay. okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start out with visual. I'm going to point to three different stations in the order that I want Deb to memorize those and to do them as quickly as she can. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, so I'm pointing. You may begin. Okay, very good. Now, it's interesting. Yesterday, she didn't do the verbalization, but today she's saying the order out loud, which is helping her remember it. Am I right? Yes. Okay. How difficult was that? It does make me think. Okay. But it's getting easier because you've been doing it a little bit. Am I right there as well? Yes. Did you feel like you got any exercise on that? Yes, I can feel my heart rate. Okay. Going up. I feel yes. like her heart rate's going up a little bit. A little bit. So we're going to do that one more time. I'm going to change the order, and I want her to go a little faster. I want to work that processing speed. Oh, great. All right, so do the best you can. This time, I'm going to auditory. I'm going to say the numbers out loud in the order that I want them. All right. Okay? Two, three, three. Two, three, three. Go. Okay. Beautiful. Okay, she did a great job that time. This time, I'm going to layer it a little bit more. I'm going to point to the ones that I want in order, and then I'm going to hold up fingers, which will be the number of repetitions I want at each station. You got it? Okay, so I'm going to point in the order first. Great. Now, a little yes. bit more work, yes. longer. Did you feel like you got a little more exercise? Yes. How difficult was that? That really makes me think really hard and have to um, verbalize it. Okay, but not frustrated. No, it's actually fun. So it's important that we talk to our clients. That's part of the behavior change and the coaching so that we can see where they are. Okay. What we observe or what we think may not really be what's happening. Now... I'm going to do one more thing. She has not seen this yet. Okay, great. So now I'm going to make it longer at each station so the flow becomes more per station. So station number one, I did the foot tapping. You're going to step back. Okay. If I'm on the left, you're going to step with the left foot and touch with the back hand, come back. Step to the right with the right foot, touch with the back hand, come back. 
So we tap with the toe, we step Can and touch. Step? Yep. Okay. So come on over. Show me again. Uh -huh. Tap with your toe, so you know that. Come closer. All right. So one tap, one, and the other one. Two, okay, uh -huh. Back up. Mm -hmm. Now, again. back up. So you're going to step. If you're going to the right, you step with the right foot in touch with the back hand okay. and come back. Step to the left with the left, touch with the back hand. Okay, so am I tapping? Okay. This? Correct. This. Okay. What am I tapping? Got it. So tap with the feet, yes. tap with the hands. Okay, got it. Good. Next one, we do our reach and bend. Then we go down to one side and up and down to the other side and up. So bend and lift, reach and up right. sideways. Uh -huh. Go to the side. Mm -hmm. So you're here. And up, across, uh -huh. and down, and across. So we're doing some lateral and rotational movement. Beautiful. Now, on this one, we go backwards, forwards, to one side, and to the other side. Four and four and four and four. Okay, well, it's getting more difficult. Okay. So take, you don't, you've got that one. All right. So we're going to do one, one repetition. I'm going to point. Are you ready? Yes. Oh, my goodness. All right. Here we go. It was one repetition. Yep. Okay, this one. Do one. Go like that and that. Now, that's the difficult one. I'm playing with it. So don't cross over. So if you're going to the right, okay. step with your right foot. Okay. Whoops, sorry. So, yeah, so if you're going over here to the right, go with the right foot. I'm, oh, I, I I'm doing a crossover. I'm showing I'm you the sorry. wrong one. Okay. And then touch it with your back hand. Touch the kettlebell with your back hand as you step out. All right. There we go. That one. Forgot that. Okay, quickly put okay. those together. Start with your feet okay. and then do the reach outs. Mm -hmm. So you closer. Yep, and then back up. Yes. Okay. Beautiful. And the last one. Okay. Okay. Which is this. This. And now, that would be hard. Down to the side and up. Down to the side and up. Down to the side and up. Okay. Nice job. How was that? <laughs> that there was more material. Uh, it's harder. It's harder. Do you feel but like you got I'm, a little more exercise? For sure. Yeah, because I can hear you breathing a little bit. Yes. Which is good. So we want okay. both of those. Are you too frustrated? No, because if I do it a second time, it'll get better. Good. And I want to say this. Today, she is doing much better than she did yesterday. So there is that learning curve that's starting to happen. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Hop on out, take a rest, <laughs> and then we're going to move on to the next one. So the next, oh, so let's talk about some progressions quickly that you saw. Go faster. Add more reps. Make it more complex as I just did. Use auditory and visual. Sometimes I let them ask a lot of questions at the beginning. As we go on, no questions. Give them hints so that you can help them think for themselves. Now we're going to do the color toss drill. We're going to use two different color tennis ball, an orange one and a yellow one. So, Deb, come on out. Let's move this equipment. We're going to set up for our color toss drill. You stand in the spot. You know where to get. And then I'm going to put some cones beside you. So back up just a hair. Right there. Perfect. I want to give you enough space that you won't crash into the ball. In fact, I'm going to move it out of your way. So safety becomes an issue as well as the ball goes away. All right. Now, yesterday when I was tossing, I made her catch the yellow one in her right hand. I'm going to switch that today because I don't want her memorizing. So we're going to start out easy. I want her to throw it back the same way she received it. Orange is in the right hand. 
Yellow is now in the left hand. So some hand-eye coordination, some thinking about which hand and how to return it. Not bad. Okay. Now I'm going to switch it. She has to return it opposite of how I sent it. I could toss it. I could bounce it. Okay, remember we've switched the hands. So this is right and this is left. Okay, okay. opposite of how you got it. Beautiful. That's okay. So processing speed. Correct. So opposite of how I returned it. Now, when the ball goes away and she doesn't catch it, there's this length of time, and then she already forgets how to return it. Am I right? Yes. Yeah. So it's, again, it's about paying attention or maybe saying it to yourself so you'll remember. Right. Okay. I'm going to add a movement now. Okay. So I'm going to toss the orange to the right hand. Okay. You are going to step to the right and do a squat. So let's try that. Okay. Yep. Right okay. Right hand, right squat. Right hand, right squat. Okay. And then toss it back the same way I sent it to you. Okay. Beautiful. Now, yellow is in the left, and instead of a squat, you're going to step, touch, and come back. Okay. Return it the same way you received it. Right. Okay. I did bounce it. All right. We're going to go a little faster. Okay. Return it the opposite of how I sent it. Right, here we go. Okay, okay which so hand do you catch right the yellow in? And I've got to do, do you? Because we switched from yesterday. Uh, so let me send it back. Okay. Left hand. Opposite of how you received it. Okay, left and then to the left I've got to do this. Correct. All right. Send it back opposite. Yes. Okay. Good job. <laughs> all right. So now, again, 80% of the time, she's doing well. You all right, frustration-wise? No, I'm fine. Good. I'm going to add another move. So oh, this be... time, you do the squat, you do the step touch, and then you circle around the cone and come back to center. One more move. Longer time before you have to send it back opposite of how you received it. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Opposite. Beautiful. Okay. Left hand to the side. Touch. And then I have to go around. And then I have to bounce it back. Nice job. Yes. All right. Let's do it one more time faster. So I want to, okay. she's got it. I want to work on processing speed. Colors. Okay. Which one? Orange goes to your? Right. Okay. okay. Opposite of how I sent it. Beautiful. Okay. Bounced. This, this, hop around. And then we get it turned back. Do you feel like your processing speed Absolutely. went up? Yes. yes. Getting better. Yeah, getting better. And getting why? Better. Are you paying more attention or is it because we've done it more often? I think it's the practice. It's the practice. And I'm having to really focus. And you're focusing better. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. All right, okay. Deb, go rest for a second. Here we go. And we're going to do one more drill. So let's look at progressions, which we just did in that drill. Go faster. Processing speed becomes a big one. Return the ball same manner, opposite manner. Add additional movements. I added a different movement on the right, a different movement on the left. Add numbers for specific movements. I didn't do that, so I could call one, two, evens, odds. You do this, auditory and visual. So mine was really visual. If I added the numbers, that would be more auditory. And then I added an additional movement, which was the shuffle around the cone. And I could just go on and on and on. It's endless because I want the heart rate up. I want to work on different skills. And I would certainly take some time and work on her squats and other things uh, to improve all of it. But today is just for you to understand how to layer some of this together. 
So we're going to do one more. This is called the clock drill. I'm going to bring Deb back out. Deb is going to stand in the middle as if she's standing in the middle of a giant clock. I'll get everything out of her way for safety. Now, we've done this before, so if she's learning, then I'm going to have to switch it a bit. So Deb, okay. yes. point to 12 o'clock for me. Point. Okay. point to 6. Behind me. Point to 3. To the right. Ha <laughs> ha. And point to 9. All right, so she had a really hard time. She was always wanting to go over here for three. So, boom, learning curve. You've got that clock down. Okay. I'm going to keep it simple. I'm going to have her tap over to a number as quickly as you can. Okay. Small numbers with the right foot, larger numbers with the left. Okay. You ready? Three. One. Six and 12, she can do either foot. Okay. Six. Twelve. Nine. Slower. Eleven. Eight. Good. So it's those in between numbers yes. that she gets a little lost on, and you know, and then I could go faster and really hit those in between numbers. Now, this time, okay. I'm gonna I you haven't done this yet. So we did certain moves on the right and certain moves on the left. Now I'm gonna make her go even and odd. Okay. Wait, so we have to think a little bit more. On the even number, okay. you will tap two, four, six, eight. Okay. On the odd number, you will step towards and step back. One, odd. three, odd. five. Even, what do you do? Even is would be, if I went to the two, I'd do this. No. So the no. even, you tap. Okay, even is a tap. And odd, odd you step. step. So go to three. Beautiful. Now, okay. the reason I asked that is I could just see some kind of something where she wasn't understanding it. Okay. You ready? I've just got to say that again. Mm -hmm. Even you, even numbers, what do you do with your foot? I'm going to walk with it. Nope, you're going to tap. Okay, even is tap. Even is Odd tap. is? Walk. Good. Okay. Okay, even is tap. Or, okay, let's do this. Two. Okay. Nine. 11, 15. okay, do you okay. do it again, 11, okay. and you're going to step all the way over, up, up, back, oh, back, up, up. Okay. 6, okay. Even. Tap. 12, Even. Tap. 5, so this would be there, and it's odd, so we would Beautiful. So you notice how processing speed slows down a little bit. It's getting a little bit more, but all in all, not bad. How did that feel this time? I get better the more often I do it. Mm -hmm. And are you feel like you're getting some exercise? Oh, yeah, because we're moving. Fantastic. Deb, you have improved already in the short period of time I've been working with yes. you. And hopefully you'll continue this. Thank you. Aw, Thank thanks you so much, much for your help. Go have another rest. So let's look at some of those progressions quickly. You want to go faster. Some of my clients who really struggle, I'll put a big clock on the wall in front of them so they can see where the numbers are. You're going to move to various numbers with different steps as we did. Different moves to the right, to the left, even, odd. Give verbal cues. I could hold fingers up so she's doing visual looking. So it's more visual than verbal. I could give her several numbers in a row. I didn't do that this time because she was kind of struggling a little bit. I could add crossover steps. Ah, and I didn't do this one this time. We had done it the last time. Mathematics. One plus one, she moves to two. Two plus two, she moves to four. And then I could actually have her do a different move on the evens and the odds. Layer, layer, layer. So with the math, we're doing a little bit more uh, executive function in that prefrontal cortex. So working different issues of the brain, with different activities. So let's sum this up. So according to Dr. Cody Seip of the Functional Aging Institute, in order to maximize cognitive improvements, you want to combine that physical exercise with the cognitive challenge in a rich sensory motor environment that includes social interaction, and I think Deb and I had that and had fun, and a heaping dose of fun. So I hope that you 
learned some information, got inspired about reading more and learning more, and are empowered that you could do some of these today. So thank you so much for attending today's live webinar. I'm going to bring Jackie back on. Thank you very much. You are so welcome. That was so exciting to watch. It was fun. Yeah, it looked like you guys were having fun. And based on the practices and you know everything that, we, that we've been doing to prepare here, I can tell you can see the, the thinking and the cognition and the recall. Yeah. And she's improving. Improved. Yeah, yeah. Which is yeah. so exciting. Yeah. So Deb's doing great. We yeah. will all want a client like Deb, right? <laughs> so, um, so thank you. That was a lot of great information. And we have uh, just a little bit of time for some questions. Super. So if you have any questions for our presenter, Dr. Diane McCaughey, please type those in now to your YouTube viewer and we'll get to those in just a few moments. Diane, as you mentioned, um, we do have a partnership with the Functional Aging Institute, American Council right. on Exercise and FAI have partnered together. And on your screen, you can see the two courses, mm -hmm. the specialist programs that we offer through FAI here at ACE. If you would like to learn a little bit more about working with this group of very amazing and exciting uh, clients that, yeah. that a lot of people have. Yeah, there's so much out there for this aging population, mm -hmm. and it's exciting that ACE and FAI are partnering, and we're going to really make a difference. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. So if you um, would like to look at your slide once again, we have some resources here, and I'm going to scroll through these. Mm -hmm. Once again, if you would like to rewind, pause, jot any of them down, feel free to do that. So I'm gonna scroll through these just for a moment. And Diane, tell us a little bit about this research and these, these resources here. Yeah, so um, again, with the thanks of, of Cody Sipe and Ryan Glatt, Ryan particularly is the one that has really given us this resources. And he's the one really doing a lot of research and looking at the controversy. So I talked a little bit about some of the controversy today and you'll read some of that in some of these resources. Mm -hmm. Is effortful exercise Size really that important is this that so we're on the cutting edge a lot more resource and research has to be done mm -hmm. so we want you guys to follow us as we keep winding through and making this better and better mm -hmm. yeah. Great. so if you do have questions for Diane and want to dig a little bit more into this topic her contact information is on your slide and you can email her and we want to make sure that we get those ace pros answer so is there any anything special you want them to yeah, know? Yeah just make sure when you email me and it is really uh, I feel very excited about being on your reference point here on anything just make sure you write ace student in the subject so I know you're not some virus or something <laughs> right <laughs> and I'll wanna, answer you back. We want to make sure those questions are answered yeah. so make sure and con connect with Diane. Also, remember that we do have the ACE Senior Fitness Specialist Program along with those partnered special programs with the Functional Aging Institute. So if you'd like to earn continuing education credits, you can do so and learn a little bit more about those specialist programs on our website as well as earning your continuing education credits that you need for the, the renewal of your certification each two-year cycle, you can join our CEC club, which allows you to get all of those continuing education credits needed for one low price. So let's take a little bit of time for some questions. We have a lot of live questions that have come in oh, wow. throughout today's presentation. So one of the things that you talked about is around, you know, Frustration, mm -hmm. right? So we don't want our clients to get frustrated, but what happens if we have clients who are in this active aging population that are very frustrated with just generally speaking kind of their cognition and memory, things like that, but you want to motivate them to do these exercises. Right. How do you approach yeah, that? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So I think it's really important that we take the new ACE coach approach mm -hmm. that really this program design is not just from the trainer, that it's a collaborative effort mm -hmm. and that there is a lot of questioning that goes on like I did with Deb. You know, how hard was that physically? How frustrating was that? Mm -hmm. So that we can get a clearer picture. I think it's also important to let them know we really don't have to have or maybe necessarily want mastery. Mm -hmm. We want them to be having to think and I, I don't even like to use the word struggle a bit, but that they're really working at this. So about 80% and let them know that. Mm -hmm. We want them to be challenged. We do, yeah. but we mm -hmm. want it to be fun. So there's yeah. that very fine line and that's mm -hmm. where specificity mm -hmm. comes into play. Mm -hmm. 
great. And building so, that rapport. Yeah, so taking the time to really yeah. talk and Absolutely. observe and understand and collaborate yeah. with the client. And there is actually a form that is used in the brain health clinic. Mm -hmm. So that is part of the uh, cer certification that's coming out. So all that data will mm -hmm. be there for them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. So one more question. Um, we had a someone type in the question around, I really want to work with this group. I, w I want to work with this population. How do I get clients like that? Well, I would say you need to get the word out mm -hmm. and you need to start building that rapport and relationships with medical people mm -hmm. who deal with these clients. Mm -hmm. GPs, neurologists, mm -hmm. et cetera. And there is a huge market out there just mm -hmm. for senior fitness and for cognitive decline. So making those relationships. Yeah, and that's a, that's a good point about making the relationships and kind of having a network oh, yeah. around Yes, because doctors. referrals mm -hmm. is going to be a big one. Yep. And we also teach how to refer, mm -hmm. which is extremely important. Mm -hmm. Because it's right. a very fine issue. You know, you certainly don't want to go to somebody and say, you're losing your marbles. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you do that? Yeah. And that it's not frightening for some people. Mm -hmm. So also knowing the personality. I have some clients that are like, thank God you told me. And I went to the doctor and found these problems out. And other people, they don't want to know. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a lot of that client-trainer interaction and it just is. building that rapport, like you yeah. said. Perfect. Yeah. Diane, thanks for joining us today. Jackie, thanks for having me. I always love coming to hanging out with the people at ACE. Yeah. So welcome any comments or thoughts that you have about today's presentation, you can connect with ACE in a variety of ways, as you can see on your screen. Make sure to let us know what you thought about today's live webinar, and we will see you next time. Let's get people moving.